In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So we could have flipped a coin for this signal honor, we three bishops who are here. Participating in the mysterious sacrament of holy baptism three Sundays ago, administered by the Holy Spirit to his granddaughter, was the recently retired Bishop of Montana, author, theologian, pastor, raconteur, the Right Reverend Frank Burkhardt. At his left sits the distinguished former suffragan Bishop of the Diocese of New York, and for important years in the life of this place, Bishop in charge of St. James in the city, the Right Reverend Catherine Roscombe. Let's make them feel welcome this morning. God bless you all. So as I think we all know who participate in the life of the institutional church, there is a grinding together of gears. We sometimes idealize it as the, as the music of the spheres, but it's actually a bloody mess <laughs> of lectionaries and people's busy calendars crunching together, resulting in outcomes such as the next rector of St. James in the city being installed on Candlemas, which is the feast of the presentation, whose principal symbol is the light of candles flickering in the temple. We have the light in the eyes of the Christ child, the mighty light of epiphany, the flickering lights of candlemen. It is a rainy day, and we are gathered together in a cloudy time. It's a time when the church is anxious, and a polarized people seem confused about their very purpose and destiny as a nation. So we strain this morning toward the light. We are hungry for the flicker of hope and of possibility. And your new rector has helped structure this service so that the light will shine after she receives the traditional gifts that come to a newly installed rector on the occasion of her installation, she has a gift for you and for us. She will bless candles for us. She will participate in the Spirit giving us the gift of light, which is the only thing we need, which signifies love, which is the only thing that works. There was a prophet, Anna. It's kind of an offhanded way for the gospel writer to have put it. The song of Simeon, which we heard this morning, made it into the prayer book. These eyes of mine have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see. We all know the song of Simeon. Anna is the only woman in the New Testament who was given the title of prophet. Amos was a prophet. Elijah was a prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. Anna was a prophet, and she only gets what journalists call an indirect quote. <laughs> she spoke about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Wouldn't we have liked to hear just a little bit more of what Anna said. When would it happen? Where would it happen? How would it happen? How exactly would the great and holy city, how would the divided and disappointing city of Jerusalem be saved? As a person of privilege in American society, I had a little bit of an Anna moment when I first met Kate last April. She was visiting from Massachusetts during the search process, a search process that our colleague, the Reverend Betsy Anderson, played an important role in as 
chaplain. I found her cheerful, expectant. I found her astonishingly well prepared by her parish ministry in Massachusetts and her global ministry, and I found her curious about what the Holy Spirit was up to in bringing her to a somewhat faded upholstered couch in the lobby of the Cathedral Center of St. Paul talking to a bald dude she had never seen before. <laughs> now, the limitations of a bishop's role at that moment when a parish is doing a search are significant. Nobody cared about my opinion at that moment, and it served me right. I felt silenced like a female voice, like the divine feminine in scripture, evangelized about and redacted by male scribes. The community of canonical dudes who gave Simeon a canical and prophet Anna a subordinate clause. If it had been me to determine what I would say and do, I would have stood in the temple and spoken about this priest to all who were looking for the redemption of the new Jerusalem of mid-city Los Angeles. Now let me be clear, St. James in the city doesn't need redemption any more than any of the rest of us need redemption. But it's a rainy day in a cloudy time. And sometimes we feel as though we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, even amid our singular prosperity as Western people, at least most of us, because the prosperity is so unevenly and unfairly distributed. But whether we're rich or poor, privileged or marginalized, we are anxious. So it's important to ask, why is it that any person comes at a particular time, whether a homeless person walking in the nave or a new rector coming from a congregation in Massachusetts? So here is, first, a global citizen. Second, a teacher. Third, a companion. Kate's childhood, her education, and her secular vocation, for a myriad of reasons owing to the circumstances of her and her family's life and choices, introduced her to the world. And we sometimes are isolationist people. We sometimes don't pay attention to the world the way we should. But it's the same world, the world Kate got to know in all of her vocations, which now in this greatest of international cities has come to the door of this church, this Church of St. James, which she is now called into leadership at. The world has come seeking communion with Jesus Christ. And she has served and lived and learned in these places in Malaysia, in Botswana, in South Africa. Kate, she was evangelized in Korea, she told me, and she first felt called to the priesthood in Uganda. Simeon, which gets, of course, top billing, says the salvation God has prepared in the presence of all people. Kate knows what it means to say all people in a globe as diverse as the one that we occupy. God is dog spelled backwards, and God has dogged her from one end of the <laughs> globe to another. And it's amusing what happens when she encounters local preferences when it comes to liturgy and church. At one point, Kate became committed to the 12-minute sermon. This has never been my particular area of gifting. <laughs> but someone representing one of the diverse communities of Christendom which have come to the door of St. James, someone came up to her once and said, and said, Kate, 
the people in my community would appreciate it if you would give longer sermons. One's rector next is above all a teacher. And what a teacher. You know, of course, her doctorate in education is from Harvard. She has taught all around the world and in the U.S. And in our country, she's worked in urban settings all over the country, studying how in the midst of scarce resources, as they are apportioned out often in urban school systems, how in the midst of the complex lives they lead, teachers and students come together and between the lines of their math and science books find the meaning of community and of relationship. She joyful and joyfully anticipates a rich collaboration with our brother Peter Reinke, the, Reinke, the newly installed head of school at St. James, and with all the students and families and staff members and faculty members of the magnificent school here in Mid-Wilshire. And finally, the Holy Spirit has enabled St. James to call a companion, a collaborator, a partner, and a friend. I'm struck always by Kate's abundant and unalloyed thankfulness. All she does is praise her colleagues, lay and ordain the wonderful justice and music and pastoral ministry of the Reverend John Kim. She talks about Canon Wenamani not only as a peerless leader of this extraordinary multicultural music program, but as a peerless and gracious gentleman. She talks about Chaplain Aidan Coe's extraordinary work with the students at St. James School. And then, in addition to her thankfulness, back again to the curiosity. We live in not only a cloudy and sometimes dark time, but an incurious time. We become locked in our narratives and we lose the capacity and sometimes the basic patience and charity that it takes to listen to the other's narrative. And there's a reason for that, because when we listen, we learn. When we learn, we become empathetic. When we become empathetic, we love. And when we love someone, we become responsible for them. And so the world convinces us that it's best not to be curious. Because if you're curious, you might end up responsible. So we cut ourselves off from the flow of the Spirit. But that is not Kate Cress's. Way. She is devoted temperamentally and vocationally to the pleasure and the constantly unfolding revelation of collaborative leadership. Sharing passion and inspiration with all the people around you whom the Spirit has put here as surely as she has put Kate testing ideas, deciding, undeciding, and redeciding, doing mission and ministry together with partners inside the church and just is important, indeed more important, because we don't do this for ourselves, do we? We do this to find nourishment and strength for the work outside the walls and gates of our churches, outside where there is so much need for justice and comfort, places to be fed, places for the simple blessing of staying dry, outside where there are so many people for us to love if we just listen and turn to them. So much hunger in them we'll find. So much hunger in them, whether they are faithful or not, whether they're Episcopalian or not, whether they're high church or not, there is in every heart the same hunger to know and love the spirit of welcome and mercy in a sometimes harsh and unjust world. Hungry to know the Christ of ineffable peace and redemp redemption. Hungry to know more about the God who promised to save the city. 
In the name of God and in thanksgiving for Kate Cress's ministry and the ministry of all of you in this place. In the name of the Father, creator, redeemer, sustainer.